Welcome back everyone to MAE 170. This is lecture 17 in week number 10. This is the last lecture for the course. However, the material that we're going to cover today will be part of the final as well. So uh, do not uh, skip it. It's not gonna be much today, so uh, that's good news. And uh, furthermore, we're gonna actually, the first thing that I want to cover is something that we've already seen, that is stability margins. I just want to teach you how to determine how to read the stability margins on the Nyquist plot. We've already seen how to spot, how to determine the stability margins using the Bode plots. And now we're gonna do the same using the Nyquist one. Let's consider a loop transfer function for one of the examples that we saw last time. So we have for this particular system, nine over S minus one times S plus two times S plus three. And just a quick reminder to check the stability of the closed loop system associated with this loop transfer function. We need to determine the number of poles of this loop transfer function with positive real parts in this case, we only have one of them, so p is equal to one. Then from the Nyquist diagram, we can count the number of times that the point number uh, minus one is encircled. In this case, we have one encirclement in the counterclockwise direction, therefore n is equal to minus one, and thus z being equal to n plus p, according to the Nyquist stability criterion, we have minus one plus one equals zero. Therefore, the closed loop system is stable. If the closed loop system is stable, the stability margins are going to be positive. So here, I've included the Nyquist plot, as well as the Bode plots, the magnitude and the phase. And, uh, Right here, the next two plots are the same, but just zoomed in so we can see things more clearly. All right, so let's review on the Bode plots how to determine graphically the gain and the phase margins. The gain margin is the difference between the zero decibel line and the magnitude line when the phase is equal to minus 180. So in this case, we have a gain margin of 0 0.915 decibels. The phase margin is the difference between the phase plot and minus 180. When the magnitude is equal to zero decibels. The concept behind the phase margin is that we want to avoid L of S being equal to minus one. So that is a critical point. Why is that a critical point? Well, that's because if we write down the closed loop transfer function, that is L of S over one plus L of S, if L of S is equal exactly to one, then the denominator of T of S goes to zero, blowing T of S up to infinity. So we want to avoid L of S being equal to minus one. Now minus one can be interpreted as usual as a complex number. So a complex number has a magnitude and the phase. So what is the phase of minus one? That is minus 180 degrees. What is the magnitude of minus one? That is one. So we want to avoid to have both magnitude equals one and phase equal to minus 180 degrees at the same time. The phase margins will tell us how far away are we from these two conditions. So if we fix a magnitude equals one, how far are, away are we from minus 180 degrees in phase? And uh, the gain margin will tell us if we are at minus 180 degrees, how far away are we from having a magnitude equal to one? Sometimes, as you've noticed, 
I talk about magnitude equals one, and sometimes I talk about zero decibels. Why the discrepancy, the apparent dis discrepancy? Well, because when I talk about decibels, I really take the logarithm of the magnitude. So if the magnitude is equal to one, 20 logarithm of one is equal to zero. So magnitude of one is equivalent to zero decibels. All right, so in the Nyquist diagram, we have, well, notice, first of all, that the Nyquist diagram is nothing but a plot in the S-plane. So we have the x-axis, that is the real axis, and the y-axis is the imaginary axis. So the minus one all obviously lies on the real axis. We can draw a circle with radius equal one. And this is gonna be this circle over here. It's just a portion of it, obviously. So all the points that lie on this circle are characterized by a magnitude equals one or zero decibels. So obviously minus one lies on the real axis, therefore its phase is equal to minus 180. But our Nyquist plot does not pass through minus one and it will have a magnitude equals one in two points, at two points. One that is over here and one that is over here. Now let's go um, down and look at this uh, zoomed in part of the Nyquist plot. So once again, we have the two intersections that I just showed you. One is here and one is over here. So which one are we considering? Well, we are considering the one corresponding to when the Nyquist plot goes into the circle. So crosses the circle of radius equal one from the outside to the inside. So always pay attention to the direction. Here we're going inside the circle and the other point corresponds to the exit from the circle of radius one. So always uh, consider the circle, uh, sorry, the intersection with the circle where the direction is going inside. So at this point, we have magnitude one, but obviously the phase is not equal to minus 180 because otherwise we would be on the real axis. So whatever we have left in terms of angle is our phase margin. So we have this angle to cover in order to not only have a magnitude of one, but also a phase of minus 180. So this is really clearly the phase margin. And in this case, it is 1.38 degrees. I forgot to mention that earlier too. Conversely, now we can identify the gain margin as the point that has already a phase of minus 180. So we are on the real axis. We want to identify the intersections of the Nyquist plot with the real axis, and then find the difference between such point and the minus one. So for this uh, Nyquist plot, we really have, well, technically three intersections with the real axis. One, two, and three. Of course, when we're um, considering the stability margins, we always want to consider the closest point to minus one. So in this case, we have this point over here. So forget about the other two. So intuitively, the gain margin can be related to the distance between minus one and this point. Gain margin itself is not really this distance. In fact, this distance is about 0 0.1. So if we go in the zoomed in picture, 
we see that we have this distance and the intersection here that we're considering is at about minus 0 0.9. So this is, I say it's almost the gain margin. If we actually want the, the actual gain margin, then you have to, you can calculate it like this. You find the value of the intersection. So in this case, we have that this is minus 0.9 and your gain margin is going to be 20 logarithm of the absolute value of one over whatever value you have. So in this case, minus 0.9. And so this gives you that 0.915 decibels. Another trick that you can use is that if the intersection of the Nyquist plot with the real axis falls to the right of minus one, so in this case, for instance, minus 0.9 is to the right of minus one, then our gain margin is positive. Instead, if it landed to the left of it, then the gain margin would be negative. Therefore, the system would be unstable. All right, so this is um, how to read the gain and the phase margin given an Nyquist plot. Okay, so now let's change topic and let's uh, talk about a little bit of error analysis and system sensitivity. Here, what I'm covering things that you can find in chapter four of your book. I'm gonna give you a summary of it. So it's not really step-by-step. Step. Um, it is sufficient that you remember what I'm covering in the lecture. So, so far we've actually considered feedback control systems without any disturbance or noise. However, in, in real life, we have to consider that there are disturbances that act that cannot be included in the controller and measurement noises. So a more realistic block diagram for a unity feedback system would look like the following. So as usual, we have our input or our desired output. Then we have our controller or compensator block. Then after it, we have the disturbance signal. Why do we insert it after the controller or after the control signal and not before? Because if it was before, then the controller would take care of the disturbance. So the disturbance wouldn't be really a disturbance anymore. However, we classify disturbance signals as something that cannot be corrected a priori by our controller. So it is an error that comes afterwards. So that's why it is um, so acts like an input to the system after the controller. So pretty much the disturbances, it is a perturbation to the control signal that comes out from the controller block. And that is fed into our process, usual G of S, and that generates the actual output. Then when we measure the output, then we're gonna feed it back and compare it to the input. However, there's always some noise that comes with the measurements. It's called the measurement noise. So we have this signal N of S, which is added to the actual input. Uh, sorry, the actual output. So where what we're actually measuring, it is a combination of the actual output plus some noise. And that is what it is effectively compared to the input. However, our tracking error, the definition of a track, tracking error is always input minus output. And so we want to find an expression for the tracking error, which will be a function of not only the input, 
but also, well, in, in the end, you can consider that we have three inputs. The actual input in terms of, you know, the desired output, so R of S, then the disturbance signal and the measurement noise. So technically we have three inputs in the, in the system. So we want to find an expression for the tracking error that takes care of or shows all these three inputs. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to solve the block diagram. So it is something that we've already seen and uh, let's do it again as a good exercise. In this case, we have three sum injunctions. So we need to name the signals coming out of each of these three sum injunctions. We're gonna call whatever comes out of the first sum injunction as EA of S, just to be consistent with your uh, textbook. So this is not actually the tracking error. This is um, a sort of an error between the, the difference between the input and whatever we're measuring, which is once again, the combination of the actual output plus the measurement noise. Then let's call the signal coming out of this sum injunction with uh, B of S. And uh, lastly, we have A of S as the signal coming out of the last sum injunction. Okay, let's write one, two, three, and four equations because we have three sum injunctions plus one equation for the output. Let's start with the signal EA of S. So going backwards, we have that that is equal to R of S minus B of S. Then B of S itself is equal to Y plus N quite straightforward equation so far. What about A of S? A of S is equal to the disturbance TD plus GC times EA of S. Now we can already use the fact that EA of S is equal to R minus B to rewrite A of S. And finally, we have the last equation, the one associated with the output. So the output going backwards is equal to G times A. And let's already substitute the expression that we just found for A. So we have that the output is equal to G times TD plus G times GC times R minus Y minus N. Okay. So from the definition of the tracking error, E equals R minus Y, we can also rewrite it so that we explicit Y as R minus E. So we're going to use this to rewrite the last equation so that we have y is equal to r minus e and then r minus y is equal to e. Because remember we want an expression for the tracking error as a function of r, t, d, and n. We don't want y in the equation. So we are left with the following. Before expliciting E of S, that's gonna be equal to one over one plus GC times G times R minus G over 
one plus G G C times T D plus G G C over one plus G G C N of S. Now we can simplify things a little bit. Remembering that G C times G is our loop transfer function L. So let's finally write the expression for the tracking error as one over one plus L of S times R minus G of S over one plus L of S times TD plus L of S over one plus L of S times N. Okay, so you see that we're gonna have three contributions when it comes to the tracking error. The first one that multiplies the input, then we have a contribution that multiplies the disturbance and a contribution that multiplies the measurement noise. Let's start by considering the contribution associated with the disturbance. So in other words, let's try to minimize the component of the error that is due to the disturbance. In other words, let's study the disturbance rejection. So in order to do so, let's consider the error when the input and the measurement noise are equal to zero. So the error is only based on the, disturb the external disturbances. So if we didn't have any input and any measurement noise, we would still have an error due to the mere fact that we have disturbances. Now, if we just consider the magnitude of such error, it is easy to realize that the error due to the disturbances goes down as the magnitude of L of S goes up. So in order to have a good disturbance rejection, we want a magnitude of our loop transfer function that is as high as possible. All right, so we have this conclusion. Now let's take a look at the contribution due of, to the error due to the measurement noise. Well, in other words, let's study the so-called measurement noise attenuation. So the contribution the tracking error due to the measurement noise. So in other words, here we're gonna set the input and the disturbance equal to zero. So this contribution boils down to L over one plus L times N. Or we can also rewrite it as L times one over one over L plus one. So clearly here, if we wanted to lower the magnitude of the error due to the measurement noise, we want to have a low magnitude for L of S. In other words, the contribution to the measurement to the error due to the measurement noise goes down as the magnitude of L of S goes down. Wait a second though, this is contradicting with what we found earlier. So if we have high magnitude for L of S, we have a good disturbance rejection, but a poor measurement noise attenuation. On the other hand, if we have a low magnitude for L of S, we have a good attenuation when it comes to measurement noise, but a very poor disturbance rejection. So it seems that we cannot have both. However, we are in luck because 
measurement noises and disturbances do not happen, do not, do not have a peak at the same frequencies. In fact, the disturbances usually are associated with the peak at low frequencies. And measuring, measurement noises have, are high at high frequencies. So we should, if we, if we can, design um, a loop transfer function. Here, I'm just using L of I omega that has a high magnitude at low frequencies and a low magnitude at high frequencies. For instance, if we had a Bode plot when it comes to the magnitude of L of S that looks like this, well, clearly we have a high magnitude at low frequencies, which will reject disturbances very well. And we have also a low magnitude at high frequencies, which will do perfectly to attenuate the measurement noises. So again, although the, the two requirements seems contradictory, they are not because uh, measurement noises and disturbances usually have peaks at different frequencies. So you can still design a system that minimizes the measurement noises and maximizes the rejections of external disturbances. Now let's take a look at one of the final things for this course, and this is the uh, system sensitivity. So the system sensitivity intuitively tells us how much the overall transfer function changes if the process transfer function changes. So if we have a minimum change in the process transfer function, how does the overall transfer function for the system change? In other words, the system transfer function is defined as the ratio between the change in the overall transfer function of the system. Here I'm just using TF because it depends, as we will see soon, if we're looking at an open loop system or a closed loop system that the transfer function is either L or T. So rate of change between sorry, the ratio between the rate of change of the, the overall transfer function of the system over the rate of change in the process transfer function, G. So let's consider two cases. On the left, we have the open loop, an open loop system, and on the right, we have our usual closed loop system. Here, we go back to not considering disturbances and noises, so, we consider the a perfect system without disturbances nor measurement noises. So we simply have our controller and our process, but one system is open and the other one is closed. So the overall transfer function for an open loop system is simply L of S. And when it comes to the closed loop system, that is T of S usual stuff, right? All right, so let's first um, calculate the sensitivity for the open loop systems, and then we'll proceed uh, to compute the sensitivity for closed loop systems. So for the open loop system, our uh, transfer function is L of S, which is GC times G. Therefore, S is delta L over L over delta G over G. We can also rewrite this as delta L over delta G times G over L. But delta L over delta G is the derivative of L with respect to G. And what is the derivative of L with respect to G? Well, it, it is simply GC.
So we have times G and L is GC times G. So this and this cancel out, this and this cancel out. So we have that the sensitivity for open loop systems is always constant and equal to one all the time. So there's nothing really that we can do about it. It's always equal to one. What about closed loop systems? Can we improve uh, the sensitivity? And keep in mind that we, we would like to have a low sensitivity because if something changes, we don't want the overall system to change dramatically its performance. We want a system that is as robust as possible. In other words, we want it to have a low sensitivity. Let's see if closed loop systems have a better performance when it comes to sensitivity. All right, so now the transfer function that we're considering is obviously the closed loop transfer function, which is defined as GC times G over one plus GC times G. Applying the same concept, the same definition for the sensitivity, but now we have delta T over T over delta G over G. Or once again, rearranging, we have delta T over delta G times G over T. So now we have to calculate the derivative of T with respect to G. So let's go here. So derivative of the numerator, we have GC times the denominator is one plus GCG minus the numerator GCG times the derivative of the denominator with respect to G, which is GC. So we're gonna have a square here over the denominator squared. And then we have times G over T. So here we flip T, we have one plus GCG over GCG. Okay, we can simplify a few things. This cancels out with this. This G cancels out with this. So we're left with GC plus GC squared G minus GC squared G. Over GC times one plus GCG. Now this goes away with this. This is just one. So we have, we're left with one over one plus GCG or one over one plus L. So you see that the sensitivity depends on the magnitude of L of S. So it will in general depend on the frequency and it is lower if the magnitude of L of S is higher. If you have a high magnitude for L of S, then you're gonna have a lower magnitude of the sensitivity function, right? sensitivity magnitude goes down as the loop transfer function magnitude goes up. And if you notice the sensitivity function, we go back to the error, was actually, or was multiplying the input. So if we don't consider disturbances and noises due to the measurements, then the tracking error is equal to the sensitivity times the input. So if we have a low sensitivity, then we're gonna have a low tracking error. Perfect, that's our, our goal.
Let's take a look at an example. This is uh, from your textbook and um, it just tells you it's a Mars rover vehicle. And the goal is to operate the rover with low sensitivity to changes in the gain K. So we're given the block diagram for this Mars rover vehicle and where our input is the planned path and the output is the actual path. And we have the plant as one over S plus one times S plus three. And uh, we're simply allowed to have a proportional controller, just a constant K, K that we can regulate. So let's compute the sensitivity function. That is one over one plus L of S, L of S being K times G of S. So it's K over S plus one times S plus three. And so this is equal to S plus one times S plus three over S plus one times S plus three plus K. So you'll see that obviously if we choose different values for K, we're gonna have different um, profiles when it comes to the magnitude of the sensitivity function. And in fact, here I plotted such magnitude, so the sensitivity function for different values of K. And in particular, we have that this curve is for K equals 10, then this is for 20, 30, 40, all the way to 100. So this is the direction of growth of K. So we see that as K increases, we have a lower sensitivity at low frequencies. However, we're gonna have a peak that goes up at higher frequencies as K goes up. So here we have to compromise. It depends on um, the frequencies that you're expecting uh, to operate at. So if you're expecting to operate at lower frequencies, then you would want a higher K. If, you're, if you think about operating at higher frequencies, then you want a lower K because otherwise your sensitivity will grow um, considerably. And furthermore, I also plotted the Nyquist plots for the systems for various um, values of K. So we have K equals 10 over here, then 20, 30, all the way to 100. So this is the direction of growth for K. And you see that not only do we have a maximum sensitivity that goes up as K go goes up, as I showed you in the uh, previous plot, but we also notice that the phase margin decreases now that we know how to identify the phase margin. Remember, it's the angle right here. So you see, as we increase the value for K, we are decreasing our phase margin. So these are all things to take into consideration when um, designing a controller. Now there's also a, a very neat way of um, realizing or identifying where the maximum sensitivity is using the Nyquist plot. Because really, um, just using the Bode plot doesn't really tell you much about the maximum sensitivity. I'm not talking about these Bode plots here because I'm actually plotting the, the sensitivity function. But when you're plotting, when you're using the Bode plot, you're using the Bode plot of the loop transfer function. So it's not really clear um, if your sensitivity is going to be a problem. So you want, always to, um, to combine the body plots with the Nyquist plot to have a better 
understanding. And let's see what I mean by considering this example. Well, first of all, before the example, I want to already tell you how to read it. So we have that, as I wrote before, the magnitude of the sensitivity is equal to the magnitude of one over one plus L of S. So the maximum magnitude of the sensitivity happens when the denominator is minimum. So when we have that one plus L of S in magnitude is minimum. And this happens when L of S is closest to being equal to minus one. And that is very easy to identify on the Nyquist plot because that's simply the distance between the closest point of the Nyquist plot to minus one. Let's take a look at the example now. Let's consider the following loop transfer function. So we have 0 0.38 times s squared plus 0 0.1 times s plus 0 0.55 over s times s plus one times s squared plus 0 0.06 s plus 0 0.5. Now here uh, we can easily compute the poles of L of S. So we have one pole at the origin, one pole at minus one, and the other two are complex conjugate at minus 0 0.03 plus or minus 0 0.706 I. So we have no poles of L of S with positive real parts, therefore P is equal to zero. Now let's draw the Bode diagram for the system. And uh, you'll see that we have a gain margin that is infinite because the system never crosses the minus 180 degree line. So the gain margin is infinite. Great. What about the phase margin? Well, the phase margin right here corresponding to the intersection of the magnitude plot with the zero decibel line, we have that the difference between the phase plot and minus 180 is pretty comfortable 69.8 degrees. So it seems we're, it's a very safe system because again, gain margin is infinite and we have a very big phase margin almost 70 degrees. That's very good. However, we don't know anything about the sensitivity of the system. What if something changes? Can the system become suddenly unstable if some parameters um, of the process change? Well, we will see. But first of all, let's take a look at the Nyquist diagram for this system. And once again, we can see that the phase margin is quite abundant at 69.8 degrees. We can also apply the Nyquist stability criterion. We see that the point minus one is not encircled by the Nyquist plot. So n is equal to zero. We had that also p was equal to zero. Therefore, z is equal to zero. And the Close, closed loop system is stable. We can double check that by computing uh, the poles of the closed loop system. And and we can indeed verify that the system is, closed loop system is stable. I haven't computed them, but you can do that. All right, so as I said, we can also spot the maximum sensitivity by looking at the Nyquist plot. So as I said, maximum sensitivity is the smallest distance between the Nyquist plot and minus one. So the minimum distance is going to be about this. So 
So this will give you, this is associated with the maximum sensitivity. So the smaller the distance, the higher the maximum sensitivity is. And in this case, this system is very, very sensitive. So I'll show you why. Now let's modify slightly the loop transfer function. So we had 0 0.38 times S squared plus 0.1 S plus 0.55. So far, everything's the same. And we have at the denominator S times S plus one, still the same. And then we have S squared plus, now instead of 0 0.06, we write 0 0.04. So a very slight change times S plus 0 0.5. Everything else is the same. So the only thing that we've changed is this coefficient that changed from 0 0.06 to 0 0.04. Let's now do the same analysis. Let's calculate the poles of L of S. We still have the two poles at zero at minus one. And then we have the couple of complex conjugate poles that haven't really moved much. Now they are at minus 0 0.02 plus or minus 0 0.707i. So we still have no poles with, of L of S with positive real parts, therefore P is equal to zero. However, now the system is unstable. And you can compute from the Bode plots and see that the gain margin is minus 0.354 decibels. And the phase margin is minus 1.52 degrees. So what happens? We have great margins. Well, the problem is that we had also a very high maximum sensitivity. And you could tell that something was wrong by looking at this part of the body plot. We had this dip here that was dangerously close to minus 180. So if for some reason the crossover frequency were to move to the right, then we would risk to go unstable. And that's exactly what happened. And in fact, now if we take a look at the Nyquist diagram for this um, modified system, we can count the encirclement of minus one. So in order to do that, let's use as usual the uh, straight line from minus one and we'll see that we're crossing once so we have a plus one clockwise and another crossing still clockwise at plus one so n is equal to two but p was equal to zero so z being n plus p is equal to two, which is positive. And therefore the closed loop system is unstable. We can verify that by computing the closed loop poles. In this case, I've done it. So we have a pair of complex conjugate poles with positive real parts. And that's why we have Z equals two. And the other two poles have negative real parts. So once again, when you're designing a system, you have to take care of, well, first of all, stability. You want the system to be, closed loop system to be stable. You want to have phase and gain margins that are positive and large enough, but you also want to have small sensitivity because otherwise the stability alone and the large margins might not be enough if something changes. Okay, so now the very last thing that I want to show you is a bunch of uh, filters because you will find them uh, when you work with control systems. And filters are nothing but um, sort of compensators. And you know they're associated with transfer functions. So we can um, plot their magnitude and their phase. Starting with the probably the, 
the most common ones, the low pass and the high pass filters. So the low pass filters is nothing but just a, a real pole. That's it, omega zero over S plus omega zero. So we have that the magnitude is equal to zero all the way to the cutoff frequency, omega zero, and then the magnitude starts decreasing. So if we are adding a low pass filter, means that the magnitude of whatever has lower frequency that the cutoff frequency is maintained, is not touched. However, the magnitude after the cutoff frequency will be diminished because you see this um, negative contribution magnitude wise due to the low pass filter. So we're passing signals with low frequencies or lower than the cutoff frequencies. And we're cutting the bend of frequencies that comes after the cutoff frequency. In fact, the, the bend of frequencies before the omega zero is called the pass bend. And the one afterwards is called the stop bend. Conversely, we can uh, have a high pass filter. So we're passing signals that have a frequencies after our omega zero. So we're passing whatever is afterwards and we're blocking or stopping the signals with frequencies before the cutoff frequency. In this case, the transfer function associated with the pass filter has the same pole at minus omega zero, but we also have a pole at the origin. Now, what you want to do sometimes instead of passing an infinite amount of frequencies after the cutoff frequency or before it, you just want to pass a certain band of frequencies. So you're going to use a band pass filter. And the band pass filters transfer function has is normally written as H0 times omega zero over Q times S. So we have a zero at the origin over, and now we have two real poles, S squared plus omega zero over Q times S plus omega zero squared. H zero is just a, a constant gain, uh, that you can design to, to raise or lower the magnitude of this filter. And Q is known as the Q factor. And so you see when you plot the Bode diagram for the band pass filter, we're only passing signals between the lower and the higher end of the frequency. So this is our pass band and the stop band are below and above omega L and omega H respectively. And when it comes to the phase, well, the band that we're passing, we're um, modifying the phase though, between plus 90 and minus 90. So you might want to uh, pay attention to that if necessary. Well, we can pass a certain band of uh, frequencies, but we can also stop a certain band of frequencies. So we have a so-called notch filter or band stop filter. The transfer function for such filters is given by this. So we have a couple of uh, imaginary zeros and then two real poles. And here, normally, you can select not only the quality factor Q, but also the two uh, frequencies, omega Z and omega P, which are called the zero circular frequency and the pole circular frequency. And you can have three different kinds of notch filters depending on the relationship between omega Z and omega P. If omega Z and omega P are the same, that we're talking about the standard notch. If omega Z is greater than omega P, then you have a low pass notch. 
And finally, if omega z is lower than omega p, we're talking about a high pass notch. Um, moreover, depending on the Q factor, we have that for low Qs, we can block a wider band of frequencies. And instead, if we select a higher Q factor, we're stopping a narrower band of frequencies. For instance, let's take a look at the standard notch. So omega P is equal to omega Z and both are equal to omega zero. And we'll let Q vary. So with omega P equal to omega Z equals omega zero, the notch filter transfer function reduces to this. And you can see that we are blocking a band of frequencies centered around the omega zero, which is called the central rejected frequency. And uh, the band of frequencies that are rejected is given by omega z over q. So you see that the higher q, the lower the the width of rejected frequencies. For instance, if you just want to cancel a certain frequency, you just select a very high Q factor. And so you're rejecting the signal. So you see the, the magnitude associated with the notch filter is very, very low for a certain frequency. And then pretty much you reject um, all the signals with that frequency. Let's say that you, you know that you have a disturbance at a very precise frequency. And if you add a notch filter that rejects that frequency, you won't feel the effects of that disturbance. And when it comes to the phase, uh, well, we have that the phase starts at zero and then goes down all the way to minus 90 and then has a, a discontinuity, comes back from plus 90 and goes back to zero. The higher the Q factor is, and only the, the lower the rejected band of frequency is, but also the more abrupt the phase change is. So, or what I should say that it goes from zero, you almost do not feel the discontinuity and then it, it goes back to zero almost uh, instantaneously as the frequency is changed. Okay, so I just wanted to mention these because you might uh, find them in the future, especially if you're working with control systems. And uh, a last few words that I want to tell you before uh, saying goodbye is just a summary of the tools that we've used in order to analyze the performance of a closed loop control system. So we have and this is what you want to visualize every time that you analyze a control system. So you want to have your root locus, you want to have your Nyquist plot, you want to have your Bode plot, and then you want to have your step input response. These are the, the magic four things that you want to look at. And as a matter of fact, you can use this command in MATLAB. It's called SISO tool. If you call SISO tool for a certain loop transfer function, then automatically it will display these four things. It's very useful, but you need uh, the control system um, library or um, toolbox. So download that if you don't have it. Okay, this is all really. And uh, it was a pleasure being your instructor. And I will see you on Thursday for the final Q&A session. Take care and goodbye.